Okay, hey everyone. Hello. Nice to be here with you all. Can you hear me in the back? L loud enough? Okay, cool. Well, uh, thank you for all. Thank you all for taking the time to come here today. You've already given me a gift of being present. I've had a hectic day and actually a hectic couple months. And uh, being here. With all of you has uh, brought me back to uh, to presence, which is a very important part of simple living. Hello. So um, I'm yeah grateful for you all being here and excited to spend some time together. Um, I'm actually going to talk for about a half hour, and then there'll be about a half hour or longer for questions. Um, I have given quite a few talks, but I have to say I'm a little bit rusty. You know, with COVID, there hasn't been a lot of gatherings. So I'm really excited to take the time to hear the questions that you have today in uh, your quest to simplify your life, your quest to live more sustainably, uh, your quest to, you know, be on a mission uh, for a, a better society and a, a better earth. Um, am I still talking loud enough for the back? Is it a little quiet yeah okay I'll try to talk a little bit louder then so today's talk is uh, simplifying your life and that's the uh, the focus is uh, of today is one to provide some inspiration and two to provide some insight and some information on how you can actually downsize your life simplify your life um, in order to live the life that you're in the pursuit of. So in the Instagram post, how many of you saw this from the Instagram on Sands Market? Cool, so some of you may have seen um, in the post that it said I, I own just 44 possessions, all that fit into this backpack. So actually at this moment, it's not 44 possessions. For one year, everything that I owned did fit in this backpack until I moved to St. Petersburg about three months ago and now I have more stuff. <laughs> I'm living uh, in a small community of people um, so fortunately I don't have to own much because we're able to uh, have things that we share as a community but indeed I, I have more than what fits into this backpack as much as I would love to still have just 44 possessions uh, not the case at the moment. But I wanted to start by sharing my story of simplifying my life and share the place that I came from and where I got to. Some people would look at this situation and when I say, you know, 44 possessions, that is everything. Every pair of socks, every pair of underwear, every card that I would have in a wallet if I had a wallet, which I don't, every form of identification, everything in that 44 possessions. So some people would look at that and I think what a lot of people do is they feel overwhelmed. They would say, well that's not attainable for me. I have three kids and I have a mortgage and I have a house or you know, I'm I have student debt or I have a you know a job or these sorts of things and so a lot of people would look at this and they would just kind of end it there and say I can't do that and then just say then I can't do anything but by my example being quite extreme the idea is that I act as a counterbalance to the extreme society that we live in the only reason that I've had to go to this extreme is because the reality of our society is that it is, in, it is extreme in itself. So the United States has 5% of the world's population, but we use about 25% of the world's resources. So by definition, that is extreme. Um, to us, it feels, to many of us, it feels quite normal. A lot of us have woken up and realized 
This isn't normal at all, actually. But for most of us, even myself, it still feels quite normal. Because what normal is, is it's experiencing the same thing day after day, week after week, year after year. When you experience the same thing over and over, no matter how abnormal it is, it can start to feel normal. And being around potentially hundreds of millions of people that are living out that norm as well, it makes it feel even more normal. But the only reason that what I'm doing seems so extreme is because we actually live in an extreme time on this earth and particularly in one of the most extreme societies on earth in this extreme time. So my hopes is that by being here today that you don't necessarily focus on the extremeness of just having 44 possessions but instead it's a time to self-reflect and to look at yourself. You know, I serve as a vessel to create self-reflection, but that's where it ends. Then it comes down to you. And so the question is, what life do you want to be living and what can you do in order to pursue that? And my focus is uh, living in a way that is beneficial to the earth, to our communities, and to ourselves. And simple living is, uh, is, is a big part of that. So, to give you an idea of where I came from to get to this point, um, if we rewind about 10 years to 2011, at that time I was very focused on material possessions, on financial wealth. I was striving for the American dream. I'm 34 years old now. I grew up in northern Wisconsin in a very rural town where everybody kind of was pretty well the same. And I was actually, a, I always felt a little different. I was uh, one of only three Jewish families up there in a completely Christian Catholic area. None of my family was from up there. We were the only few Greenfields. My mom was a hippie, my dad was a hippie. You know, we were different. And so growing up in a society where everything was kind of the same, I, I've, I realized later in life that what I was trying to do for the first couple decades of my life in many ways was to be normal. I watched the mainstream TV, I listened to mainstream society, and it created this foundation of wanting to pursue the American dream largely because I thought that's how I would fit into this society that I was a part of. And so for my early teens, into my early 20s, for about a decade, that's where I was at. I was looking at life through the lens of how will people think of me by seeing this action? The clothes that I'm wearing, the items that I own, what I say, what I do. And I was very focused on fitting into that society. In my teens, I decided that my, one of my goals was that I wanted to become a millionaire by the time I was 30. Um, because I saw that as success in this society that we live in. And so that was my pursuit through my early 20s. And then in about 2011, um, I was about 25 years old. Something happened and I realized that I needed to really radically transform my life. I, I needed to change everything. Uh, about the way that I was living. And for a lot of people, they would assume, okay, well then, you know, what was the aha moment? Or this some sort of like, you know, big moment of enlightenment, possibly a passing in the family or a near-death moment. But for me, all that happened was I started to educate myself. I started to watch a lot of documentaries and started to read books, started to spend time around people with different mindsets. And I realized that so much of what I was living was just one big illusion that was sold to me by mainstream government, mainstream corporations, mainstream society. And I realized that the life that I was living in many ways was a lie. I learned that almost every action that I took was causing destruction to the world, from the food that I was eating, to the car that I was driving, to the cheap junk I was buying at the store, to the trash that I was creating. Even the water that I was drinking in San Diego was being pumped across the desert, running the Colorado 
river dry and then half of it was evaporating into the air in the desert before it even got to me. So I even learned that the water I was using was causing destruction. And so at that point I could have felt, you know, total doom and gloom. I could have felt helpless and hopeless. But instead I actually felt empowered because the books that I was reading, the documentaries that I was watching, they didn't just tell me the problems in the world, which there are many, but they also taught me the solutions. I learned that for every way we're doing things that's destructive, that's unjust, that's un inequitable, there's another way to do it that's regenerative, that spreads justice and that is equitable. There's a way of doing it that's not just sustainable, but that actually can improve the world around us. And so I became focused on that. I became focused on not the problem, but the solution. I felt that it's important to educate ourselves on the problem, but not get stuck there. Because it's easy to get stuck in that situation. For me, the focus was, what can I do to now to be a part of the solution? And so, simple living was a big part of that. Because I realized that, well, if almost everything in mainstream society causes destruction, then maybe if I can remove myself from those things, by simply needing less, living a simpler life, then I can decrease the number of ways that I'm causing destruction, that I'm causing injustice uh, in the world. And so it really came to stripping back. For me, sustainable living and simple living, it wasn't about having more. It wasn't about going out and finding more things or necessarily putting like big solar panels on my roof that cost money, my thought was how can I just strip back? And this is also for me about freedom because I learned that so much, so many of the corporations that exist, by us being a part of that, we are a part of the corruption and the destruction that they, that they embody in order to bring these products to us. So for me, it kept coming back that it's about simplifying life. And so what I did at that time is I made a long list of the changes that I wanted to make. And I made a goal that I would just make one positive change at a time. I had already learned that goal setting is important. Uh, writing down your goals is important. Uh, verbalizing them and sharing them, them with other people so it keeps you accountable. And so that's what I decided to do. I made a long list of the changes that I wanted to make and I hung it up in my kitchen, not just where I would see it every day, but where anybody who entered the house would see it every day. And what I did is I taped a pen to a piece of string and taped that to the wall next to that piece of paper. And then my goal was just to check those things off, uh, those, those changes in my life, uh, day by day, week by week. And that's what I did. My goal was to make at least one positive change per week and I did that for about two years. And so one positive change per week for two years, that's a hundred positive changes. So imagine a hundred things you're doing right now and then imagine two years from now changing those things. That's quite the revolution in your life and you can do that one step at a time. So. For me, I didn't feel overwhelmed because I decided that I was just going to tackle it one bit at a time. And so a lot of that came down to my living situation, the house that I was living in and the amount of stuff that I had. Because I learned that this dream of the American life, which is to accrue lots of possessions, ultimately was tying me down and preventing me from be able, being able to live the life that I truly was yearning for. And so I realized that one of my full-time jobs that I was about to embark on was unraveling the last couple decades of my life, all that I had built. I had seven or so credit cards, I had some debt, I had a three-bedroom apartment that I had lots of stuff in. Um, I didn't have a mortgage or, or children at that time, so I had much less to unravel than many people do when they wake up. But even still, even as a single 25-year-old guy, I still had 
a big task ahead of me to unravel all of these ties to the system because what I found is that the more money that I needed, the more bills that I had, the more money I needed, the, the harder it was to actually be able to pursue what I really wanted, which was a life that was in harmony with the earth, with other people and with other species. And so I began the journey of downsizing in about 2011 and I just have to say up front, it's work. Like if you're looking to simplify your life, set aside some time because it, we live complex lives. We are very tied into this globalized system where everything that we do, maybe not everything, but most everything that we do has a local implication and a global implication. We are tied into this to the point where our lives are so complex that it's hard to fathom how our actions, the things we buy, the services that we use, the businesses that we go to, the food we eat, there's people all over the world that their lives are impacted every day because of each one of us here. So it's, it's complex. And so I would just say, open that space because it's a lot of work and you're going to uncover things that you're not going to be happy about. Um, and most of you probably already have. But my suggestion is to take it one step at a time. So for me, it was, you know, a lot of people, they look at where they want to get to and that's where their focus is. But what I recommend is setting goals that allow you to get to where you want to be. Because if your goal is to live the absolute most simplest of lives, but you're living in an apartment or a house with $3,000 worth of bills per month and two cars and all of this, you're not going to get there overnight. It, it takes time and it takes work. So for me what I did is I started with some of the small things. Um, I had, for example, a dream of existing without a car at some point. But when I first began this journey, that was like a dream. I was not able to att attain, you know, existing without a car at that point. But one of the first steps that I made was I, I bought a bicycle. And I hadn't done a whole lot of riding. The longest ride I'd ever done was when I was in fifth grade. And I was, you know, that was 15 years prior. So I was uh, not by any means a cyclist. So I started out just instead of driving to the grocery store that was a mile away, biking there instead. Or, you know, just little by little, I would start by doing a few miles, starting to run errands that were a few miles away. Eventually, my, uh, I guess she wasn't my girlfriend, but someone that I was, was dating at the time, lived about seven miles away and there was a bridge. And one day I crossed that bridge over into Pacific Beach from Ocean Beach and that was a step forward. And then, you know, eventually did 30 miles in a day. And so it was a gradual thing. So some of the, you know, the early changes that I made, a big one was food. I think in simple living, food is the center of, of this. It, food is the center of our lives. Uh, it's the center of our social lives, the way we interact with others. It's the center of our health and well-being. It's the, it's the center of our existence. Without it, we simply would not exist anymore. So for me, so much of it was, was food. So a big thing was giving up the big box stores like Walmart and starting to go to the local farmer's market. I was fortunate to live next to a food co-op, which there's no food co-op in St. Pete, but there is Rollin' Oats, for example, where you can buy foods in bulk, uh, unpackaged. Um, I started to pay attention to the foods that I was putting in my body. Another early thing was thinking about not just what I was putting in my body, but what I was putting on my body. And that's something that's represented well here at Sands Market. I realized that I was just covering my body with toxic chemicals. 
my shampoo, my conditioner, my face wash, my toner, my deodorant or antiperspirant, my body wash, my Listerine, my toothpaste. The list goes on in the number of ways that I was covering my body in toxic chemicals, all because some companies had told me that that's what I needed to do to fit in. And I started to think about it and I thought, okay, humans have existed forever without deodorant and antiperspirant. Surely I can exist today in 2011, 2012 with, without deodorant. So that was uh, about nine years ago and I haven't put on deodorant since then. And if any of us get a chance to hug, you will, you will see that a, a human does not need deodorant to be a happy, healthy, contributing member of society. So as far as simplifying goes, that was a big one. Thinking about my, the way that I was eating and realizing that I didn't need all these extravagant pre-made meals, but I could eat simple ingredients and cook healthy meals with those. And the things that I was putting on my body, well, I realized that about 90% of them were completely unnecessary. I was wearing Old Spice because there was a really good multi-million dollar advertising budget that convinced me to wear Old Spice. That's the only reason I, was, I had Old Spice on and I realized I didn't, I didn't need that anymore. So for a lot of it, it was asking, do I really actually need this? That's a good foundational question when it comes to simplifying life. Simply asking, do I need this? Do I want this? Or what is influencing me to make me feel as if I need it or want it? And simply by asking that basic question before purchasing something or accruing something, you can really tame that need for consumerism right back by asking that, that very simple question. And so that became a foundational question in everything, both in downsizing my life, but also in interacting in what I was or was not going to bring into my life. Because there's two big elements of simplifying and downsizing. There's dealing with all the stuff you already have and getting rid of that. And then keeping all the stuff that's trying to force its way into your home and into your life uh, at bay. So there's two, you know, there's two big elements there. So after about one year, uh, well, yeah, to stay within that, what I decided is that I was going to remove my life of all the things that did not serve my best interest and serve the mission that I uh, decided that I was going to pursue. And so I had, at the time, the biggest bedroom in the three-bedroom apartment and a closet full of stuff and a balcony or a patio. So I had to deal with all the stuff that I had. And so I'd like to share some of the strategies that I used in order to get rid of those things that I think could be useful for you as well. So the first, you've all probably heard of Marie Kondo. Uh, the question she asks about possess possessions is, does this spark joy? And the question that I learned to ask myself prior to, ever, to, prior to having heard of the wonderful woman was, does this bring value to my life? So what I decided to do was I, was, I had to go through every possession in my house and ask myself, does this bring value to my life? So when I say that it's work, it's real work. You know, imagine everything that you have right now and having to go through a lot of those individually and ask those questions. So there were a few main questions I would ask. Does this bring value to my life? Do, or, on the other hand, does it actually take away value from my life? Does this actually take away time and freedom to be able to pursue what I want? Does this cost me money to own? So is this something that forces me to stay within the rat race by owning it? There's some things that you own that actually help you to live in a self-sufficient or community sufficient manner where it allows you to live simply. There's other things that you own that have a bill attached to them or have a constant maintenance attached to them that actually keep you stuck in the trap. So for example, 
my iPhone, which back then I think it was probably like an iPhone 6. Well, I was updating that thing all the time. You know, the software, it was trapping me into this constant updating of apps and software. And then there's the constant updating of the devices themselves, which means that device, in a way, it's an asset, but in a way, the way they've designed it, it's a guarantee that you're gonna be spending a couple hundred dollars for a lot of people every year. So that question of, is this something that um, costs me money and time, or is it something that creates freedom and, and saves me money in having it? And then the other big question that I like to ask is, when was the last time that I used this? And so what I would do is, I would love to say it's just one question, that would be simpler, but it was more like three questions. And it wasn't always that I needed three questions, because for a lot of them I could just look at it and say, I don't need that. Or I could look at it and say, I absolutely want that without having to ask those questions. But I would look at the item and I would say, does this bring me value or does it take away? Is this costing me money and keeping me in the rat race or helping me to be out of it? And then when was the last time that I used it? And as far as the last time that I used it, the strategy that I would use and that I recommend is for me, it would be, have I used this in the last six months to 12 months? And if I hadn't used it, then the general answer would be that I would get rid of that. And so you have two ways of going about this. You have going, diving in deep and just immersing in it for you know, a full on weekend, a full on week, a full on month, depending on your situation, and just going through everything if, and, and downsizing. That's an option for some people who have the free time uh, right now. And then the other option is to do it a little bit at a time. I do recommend if you are really trying to simplify to take the time to do some immersive sessions of it where you can really get into the flow of it. If you do just a half hour or an hour at a time, it can be difficult to get into the flow that is the release because often it takes a little bit of energy and work to get into the, release, the stage of releasing each time. So if you can start by setting aside an entire weekend, if you're really striving to simplify and downsize, that is something that, that I would recommend. But if all you have time for is a little bit of time here and a little bit of time there, every bit is more meaningful than doing nothing. So what I did is I went through everything in the house and I asked those questions and I got my life possessions down by about half. So the average American owns, there is no definitive statistic on it, but one of the ideas is about 30,000 possessions. It's a lot of stuff that most of us own. So it took me quite a bit of work and I got my stuff cut by about half. Um, and then what I did for the first couple years is I would do a session like that every six months and I would ask those same questions. And this gave me the opportunity because I'd remember six months ago those same possessions and okay now that one possession that I, I held on to because I thought I'd use it in the next six months, well I didn't. Now it's been a year or 18 months since I used it. Now I can release that one. And so for a for a period of a couple years, that's what I did, is went through and I did these large purges, and then I did smaller ones in between in order to get rid of the items that I didn't need. So there are many ways to do that. Um, Sands Market is a, a zero waste store, so obviously our recommendation is not to rent a dumpster and fill it up with all of your stuff um, to put in the landfill. So there's a lot of recommendations I have as far as downsizing, how to downsize that, that come before uh, the landfill. One of the simplest things to do is share the things that you have with other people. And I think one thing that I wanna mention before getting into that, this is a very important foundational aspect of simple living 
You know, a lot of people look at the life that I'm living and they think, wow, he goes without so many things, like so much sacrifice. Uh, you know, how does it, it must be difficult to exist without all of those things. And I'm sure that's, that's a mindset that many people here tonight might have as well. But what's so important to remember about simplifying and downsizing is it's not about getting rid of. It's about making space to have the things that you want. So, so many of the things we have actually are distractions from being able to live the lives that we really want. Our stuff gets in the way. The time that it takes to clean our house when we have so much clutter in it, the time it takes to organize it, the bills that are involved in it, the, uh, the maintenance that is involved with it. It's an incredible amount of time and energy that goes into, um, into this stuff. And so what's really important to realize and to remember is it's not just about, it's, not, it's really not about what you're giving up. It's about what you're making space for. So a lot of people feel like, okay, they're, you're creating a void. They're, you know, they're, there's possibly going to be a hole in your heart or in your spirit because you don't have all of this stuff anymore. But the reality is what it is, it's, it's, it's an immersion in making the space to be able to pursue what it is that you want to be pursuing, whether that's crafts or hobbies or whether it's spending time with your loved ones, your partner, your friends, your family, um, whether it's pursuing skills, hobbies, passions. That's really what this is about. Wow, I've been talking for 30 minutes already? <laughs> okay. It's a good thing we left an hour. Okay, so as far as some of the, some of the strategies for actually getting rid of stuff. Um, there's quite a few ways to do that. What I, some of the things that I recommend are looking at these items and, well, I'll get to the sentimental aspect of it. The first thing is start with what's easy. Don't start with your most sentimental possessions and try to get rid of those. Start with what is going to be really easy, decluttering the stuff you don't need. I mean, maybe you're saving yogurt containers and you're never going to use those and you have like 60 yogurt containers. Get rid of those first. Unless yogurt containers are actually your attachment, then deal with those later. But start with the things that are easy. Start with the low-hanging fruit. And that's the same recommendation I have with, with sustainable living. And you really can't separate simple living, sustainable living. It, it's all, you know, deeply connected. But my recommendation is always to start with what's easy. Start with what you're excited about. If, if, you, if you feel like organizing the garage is your worst nightmare, but you feel like your bedroom is something you'd be super excited about working on, then start there. So start with both what would be easy and start with what you're most excited about. And there's a strategy behind that. Um, the strategy is that creates momentum. So action creates more action. And so if you can start with the things that are going to get you into a flow, the things that are harder will actually become easier. And to give you a little reference with my journey and going back to the idea of not having a, a car, at the beginning, again, that idea was largely unfathomable. Not just because of that's how you get around. It's also ego. Owning a car, you know, for so many of us, our car is so much of our, our image. And where I grew up, if you didn't have a car and you were an adult, it was kind of like, what's wrong with this person? Like, that was the idea that we had in northern Wisconsin. Like, why wouldn't you have a car? And to see an adult man riding a bicycle, not in like the speedo clothes, but in, you know, clothes like we're wearing, the assumption would be, oh, that person must have gotten a DUI. And that's why they're riding a bike as an adult. Otherwise, they'd be driving a car. So there's the social stigma around all of it. 
So at the beginning, I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't ready to deal with that social stigma. I hadn't gotten to the idea that I could exist without a car, logistically or egotistically. And so that took a year and a half, about a year and a half. But after I rode my bike a little more and I rode my bike a little bit more, eventually I got rid of my car and it's been, I think about seven years that I have uh, exist with, existed without a car. So I can say, whether it's Florida or Wisconsin or Southern California, as many people know, it is indeed possible to exist and be a happy, healthy, contributing member of society without that. And I think that's one of the really important things also to address is that so much of this that you'll find is that it's not necessarily the item itself that you're trying to get rid of or the way in which you're trying to simplify and downsize. It is the way that it is perceived by society. So, so much of our, our persona, so much of our possessions, our financial situation is based on social stigmas and how we will be perceived by society. And so more so than the act of actually getting rid of something, it's the act of having the self-confidence and strength to say, it doesn't matter what people think about me based on material possessions. And coming to a place of having the self-worth that what matters, what people think is based on your actions, and who you are, what you say and what you're doing for the earth. And so what I started to do was rather than asking <clears throat> how do my material possessions and my financial status reflect upon myself from society, I would ask myself when I was going to purchase something, when I was going to make a change, when I was having interactions with society, I would say, is this beneficial to the earth? Is it beneficial to my community? And is it beneficial to myself? Not how will it be perceived and what, people, what will people think about me? And that is what set me free more than anything that I have done. Because, you know, one way to think about it is when I was younger and, you know, high school and university, I would spend up to an hour per day um, making my hair, making my clothes, my, my, my outward appearance. I would spend a good hour per day designing life based on what other people would think. And if you think about one hour per day, it doesn't really seem like a lot. But when you actually do the math, you realize one hour per day is three entire years of your life. And if you take into account the amount of time you're actually sleeping, it's actually five years of your waking life if you just spend one hour per day wondering what people are going to think and acting based on that. And so when I decided I'm just going to be done with that and instead again ask, is this beneficial to the earth, my community, and myself? That's what set me free. I mean, it gave me five extra years of existence in a way, but it also changed my entire lens of the way that I perceived my interactions with society and freed me up. Because when you think about it, if the stuff that you own and the things you do are really based on the way people perceive you, then in a way you're living sort of a lie. Because it's not really who you are. You're creating this thing that you're not actually, that you aren't actually. And so there's a saying that I heard, I think it was p possibly Mahatma Gandhi, and it's uh, when your actions and your words and your beliefs are in alignment, something to the effect of that's freedom. I don't remember, but we'll say that's what it is. To me, that is freedom. That's what, I, that's what I consider flow. When you can align your actions and your belief system 
and your thoughts into one, that allows you to get into a flow where all of these like details of how to simplify your life kind of fall by the wayside because you are in a flow of being in an alignment with your, your existence. So, and another part about it is that you'll see that a lot of things happen when you start to simplify your life that you never thought about or realized or expected and you see that things are really deeply connected. So, for example, getting rid of my car, that was kind of one of the you know, big pinnacle things for me was not owning a car because of the insurance, the registration, the maintenance, the, the time that I would spend in there angry, like yelling at traffic. In, in so many ways it was toxic for me and toxic for the earth. But there was one thing I never thought about. Once I started to ride my bicycle, I realized I didn't have a trunk anymore. And by not having a trunk, it meant I didn't have a whole bunch of space to put stuff at the store. If I went to the store, I could only carry what fit onto my bicycle. And that was, you start to see as you start to make these changes and you, you make another one and you make another one, it, it all starts to come together and all the things that seemed disconnected, all you start to see are actually quite connected. And so that was one of the biggest things with getting rid of my car is that it forced me to buy a lot less stuff and it made it easier to live more simply because, well, I couldn't drive, I couldn't go somewhere that was 30 miles to buy something that I didn't really need. And the same with not having a credit card. I got rid of my last credit card, I think in 2015, and that meant not being able to just buy what I needed at any moment. Because instead what it meant is I'd have to ask a friend, hey, can you buy this and I'll pay you cash? And it took effort. And so one of the other important parts about simple living is the things that you don't want to do, make them hard. And the things you do want to do, make them easy. If you turn the things you don't want to do into a burden, it will become much easier to not do it. And if the things that you really want to do, you design your life so that it is designed in a way where those things naturally flow and are easier, you will do those things more likely. So as far as some of the ways to get rid of things, um, you can make it fun. Uh, one way to do that is to do it with friends. It can be lonely and it can be emotional. So to have a support and do this as a team with other people, whether it's family that's living in the same house or roommates, or you have a friend that's on the same journey and you take time, take, uh, take turns going to each other's apartment or home and doing it. So I do recommend when you have that, if you feel that, doing it uh, with, with a partner, with friends. Um, some of the ways to get rid of things. My first thing was selling a lot of items. Because when you sell something that you don't need, that means if you end up needing it, you can, you can buy it again. So one way to do that is to try as much as possible to buy used items rather than new items. Because then you buy a shelf for 40 bucks, you decide you don't need it, you sell it for 40 bucks, and then if you need a shelf again, you buy another one for 40 bucks. You haven't lost money in doing so. so Selling things is one way to get rid of things. My recommendation, if you're trying to downsize your life pretty quickly, is don't worry about selling the things that are 50 cents and a dollar. Selling the higher dollar items that might allow you the funds in order to get things that you might want uh, to pursue your passions. Um, so for example, I sold like my stand-up paddle board or uh, I don't remember, it's been quite a while, but things that I could actually get, get some money more for and it was worth my time. You can always donate some things to thrift stores. One thing to keep in mind with that is that a lot of stuff we donate to thrift stores actually gets thrown in the dumpster. So do be conscious of that. Some thrift stores do a much better job than others. Also, some thrift stores just dump it on other countries that don't actually need the stuff. Uh, clothing, for example. A lot, of, uh, a lot of countries have the clothing dumped on them in uh, the parts of the Caribbean, in Caribbean and parts of Africa, Southeast Asia. 
And what happens is it destroys their local clothing economy because now they got this cheap, fast fashion that's been dumped there and then people don't need to support the local businesses. So I just like to give that disclaimer with uh, thrift stores is do a little research and find thrift stores that are actually valuing the items. Um, you can have uh, clothing exchanges with friends. One thing that I really enjoyed was basically like a giveaway party. So everything that I didn't want that wasn't junk, I, I made it easily accessible in my apartment and then I had a party for all my friends where they could come take the things. Beautiful because it was going to a good home. It saved me a lot of work because they came and got the stuff and I was able to feel the value spreading to, in, to my friends. Um, and then another thing on that note is, well, after like try, trying to find a home for things and use things is important. But what's also important is to not become so overwhelmed trying to make sure everything has a home to the point where it makes it too much to be able to deal with the stuff. So be reasonable with yourself. And so I think one thing to remember is that in downsizing, you're probably going to have to create some garbage. And I know we're at a zero waste store, so that may come to, as a shock to you. I practice a lot of zero waste uh, in my own lifestyle. But something that I've come to realize is that if you've got a pile of garbage in your house, it doesn't make too much difference whether that pile of garbage is in your closet or it's in the landfill. Eventually that pile of garbage is going back to the earth, whether you hold on to it for the next 60 years or not. So I think like I recommend doing a, you know doing a good job to try to find new homes and distribute items but not like holding yourself so tight to the idea of creating absolutely no garbage. Um, some things some things are garbage. I mean, that's the reality about it is that a lot of the stuff that we've gotten suckered into buying is cheap. It was designed for the dump. Planned obsolescence was built into it. And a lot of stuff is broken and needs to be removed from our lives in order to be able to move on to the lives that we desire. So in my opinion, the landfill or some other creative means, not piling, I wouldn't, yeah, the, I think the landfill, I don't, you're not going to be able to just dig a hole in your backyard and build it, or fill it in there, but uh, the landfill is, is, I think, a realistic part of your path of downsizing and, and simplifying your life. Um, but as much as possible prior to that, composting, paper, cardboard, any items that you have that are compostable, I'd recommend composting first, um, recycling, and then lastly, the landfill. Um, but yeah, basically don't fool yourself that by holding on to all those plastic forks in your drawer for the next 30 years that you haven't created garbage and waste. They're garbage. One day they're going to the landfill or back to nature, whether you like it or not. Uh, even if you make beautiful art from those plastic forks, eventually that beautiful art is going to get picked up by a hurricane and end up in our ocean or to the landfill prior to that. Uh, in fact, I feel like it's probably safer in the landfill than in Florida that might flood in 30 years. Your forks may be more likely to go to the ocean that way. So anyway, I do recommend not being too hard on yourself. Um, we have all well, not all of us, but most of us have bought into a lot of this American dream. Many of us have woken up to the fact that this American dream is the world's nightmare. We didn't create it, most of us here. We don't hold the weight of the whole world's... We don't hold the weight of the world on our shoulders. Uh, so, just keep that in mind. You know, we, 
We are in the situation that we're in and all we can do is move forward. So my hopes is that um, tonight has, has been and will continue to serve as a chance for self-reflection. So not looking at, again, this, but instead embracing that you are you and you can only be you. You are where you are and you can only be where you are right now. And you are in the time that you are in and that's the only time that you can be in. You can't be in your two year from now fully simplified and downsized life. You can get there, but you have to take the steps in order to get there. And those steps start right here in your body as you in this time, in this place. Um, so just keep that in mind and be dedicated. <clears throat> Be hard on yourself some. It's going to be uncomfortable. Like, get uncomfortable. It's, if you're not getting uncomfortable, you're not going to get to the place of, of simplicity and sustainability and a place of justice and, and equity. You're not going to get there without being hard on yourself. But also remember, we have been thrown into a tumultuous, difficult time and we also need to Embrace that and, you know, love ourselves and, and, and embrace the time that, that we exist in. So that's how to downsize and simplify your life. <laughs> so I'd love to hear the questions that you have and no question is, is off the table. Finances, romance, personal hygiene. Here's the thing about simple living. It's everything. Everything in our lives is simple living, is sustainable living. So this is not permission to ask everybody those questions. There's a lot of people who don't want to be asked those questions, but this is permission to ask me any of those questions. I highly doubt you can come up with a question that hasn't been asked before, but if you do, I would love that. That would be fun. Um, and, one, and so, yeah, any questions that you have, um, don't be shy. I will repeat the question after you've asked it so everybody can hear it. And before we do that, I just want to say uh, thanks so much to Sands Market and to Lita's Jungle for putting this on. I would definitely love to do this again. It's a wonderful spot. <clears throat> And um, there's a toilet paper plant for everyone. The genus and species is Plecranthus barbatus. Ooh, the legs. <laughs> so this, this plant is called uh, Plecranthus barbatus or blue spur flower. And if any of you watched my videos from Orlando, you will know that I wipe my butt with this. This is also called the toilet paper plant. Um, it's a wonderful plant. It produces a beautiful blue flower that it brings in hummingbirds. It's in the mint family. It has a wonderful minty smell. Um, it's soft as can be. When you come up here and take a plant, you'll see it. It's better than, I'm not going to use any name brands and give them any <laughs> form of endorsement, but it's, it's really better than any toilet paper you can buy at the store. When you pluck off a leaf, it stays both strong and soft for an entire week. Literally, you could take them camping or you can use them at home in your compost toilet. And for all of you wet wipe lovers, which I'm sure there's some in the room, if you have on a dewy morning, the dew gets stuck on all these fine hairs and actually creates a natural wet wipe as well. Um, and I'm sure, oh, needs very little water, needs very little nutrients. You plant one of these, one of these in a year's time is a house supply of toilet paper basically forever. So it's, it's truly a wonderful plant. Wherever you go in the world, there is a toilet paper plant. Here, uh, the, the, the best one that I know of is Plecranthus barbados or blue spur flower or the toilet paper plant 
If you want to know more about this or 10 other ways to wipe your butt for free, you can go to robgreenfield.org slash toilet paper and all the information you need is, is there. Okay, so that was a slight segue, I feel. But uh, who's got a, the first question? The question was, what is it about not wearing shoes? Why don't you have shoes on? Um, so sh for me, uh, I could uh, sum that up in the simplest way by saying, I just don't need them. I realized that uh, these shoe companies that tell us that every 500 miles you need a new pair and it costs 120 bucks and you need us simply to exist. I thought about it and same thing with the deodorant. What did humans do before shoes? We've only had them for what? A few hundred to a thousand years and humans have existed for 10,000 or a few tens of thousands of years. So I just, it was simply about asking that question of, do I need these? And the question that I came to was, must not, because we existed before them. But that really brought me to a whole lot more than that. I think that being barefoot is at the heart of simple living. Couple things, when you don't have shoes, they don't want you in the mall or the bars. They don't want you in all the places that I don't want to go. So it forces me to stay away from those places. It slows me down. I truly cannot run as fast barefoot as I could if I was wearing shoes. But what that means is that I actually have less injuries by being barefoot because being barefoot forces me into a more natural pace that my body is designed for. Having shoes I believe often gives a false sense of security. You're able to just pound those feet and those knees and those hips into the ground because of the shocks. But we know that in time that harms the body. Tennis and basketball and running on track. Our shoes make it appear that we can do these things but the level of hip replacements that we have in our society shows that really that's not what the body is designed for, how it's designed to do. Being barefoot forces me to live within the mean, the natural means of my body that will hopefully allow me to live healthfully for the decades to come. So really it's, it's a form of natural health care, it's a form of simple living, it's also sustainable living. I don't have to buy new shoes made of junk every, for some, you know, every couple months or every year or even couple years. Um, it's also freedom from finances too. The amount we spend on shoes in our lifetime, well I've cut that by you know thousands of dollars. Um, so there's so many reasons but ultimately to me it's, and I, I, it's that I'm simply allowing the body to work as it was designed. I believe that the body knows better than Nike. I believe that the evolution of the human body over tens of thousands of years knows a lot better than some people behind the computers and in the factories that also have the desire to make a bunch of money. So the question was when I was in the backpack stage and I would go to the farmers market how would I cook things? Um, so I do carry a pot. Uh, it is one of my favorite and most purposeful of all possessions and one thing I would say, a tip to keep in mind with possessions, is have them be multi-purposed. The more functions one possession can serve, the less possessions that you need. So this is indeed my pot. I've had this possession for maybe five years. So I can cook with this if I'm camping, sleeping outside, or if I'm at somebody's house. It's my um, to-go container if I'm at a restaurant. It's my um, to like taking meals with me on the go. Um, I've used it for uh, a shovel, you know, scooping sand. I peed in it quite a few times, like by my bedside when I didn't feel like getting out of bed. This thing, you know, has a lot of purposes. Um, so. Uh, 
bit of a sidetrack, but that is something that I absolutely recommend is looking at your possessions and focusing on possessions that have many functions and purposes in your life so that they're utilized quite a bit. Um, so my life is, is actually different quite a bit from year to year depending on the project that I'm doing. When I did my month of living like the average American and wearing all my trash, I was eating what the average American eats. I was eating at McDonald's and pizza and, and shopping out, for example. When I'm biking across the United States on my bicycle, then I'm camping and I'm maybe cooking over the fire or staying with other people and cooking with them. I've lived in a tiny house twice. That was easy, you know, for shopping at the farmer's market because I just bring it back to my house. But often when I'm traveling, uh, I think that's one, you know, important thing is, is it does require some adaptability because things are constantly changing. As much as I would love to have one way of doing things at all times, I don't because I live in different scenarios, I live in different climates from time to time, I stay with people, I, I travel and stay with people quite a bit. But as far as um, grocery shopping without a car, or grocery shopping or going to the farmer's market without a car, uh, a bicycle with panniers, which uh, panniers are bicycle bags, panniers a French word I believe. Um, so they're bags that hook onto a bike rack on your bicycle. That to me is such a pinnacle of living simply is with your bicycle having a bike rack on the back and having bike bags or simply um, milk crates as well but I really like to have bike bags and then even I've lived with a, a, a trailer too for being able to carry large items as well. So what he said is that you, you know, saying I said that I, you have to get uncomfortable in order to simplify your life and basically how to go about getting uncomfortable or introducing oh, and I I introducing uncomfortability to your life well I'm definitely the guy to ask for that because I have introduced a lot of comfortability to my life now with that being said I want to acknowledge that I live a very comfortable Western privileged life you know I live in the United States I fit in with the status quo. Um, I've gen been generally had what I needed in life. You know, I, I have a, a lot of privileges. And so the fact that I'm able to enter a state of uncomfortability in, by choice is, you know, is very much a privilege. And I just want to acknowledge that. And I think that is a very much an important thing for for most of us to acknowledge. Um, as far as how to introduce uncomfort into your life in order to eventually get to a place of comfort, because the idea isn't to live uncomfortably for the rest of your life. The idea is to create systems and get into a flow where what used to make you uncomfortable becomes your state of comfort. So I'm not uncomfortable with most of these things that other people feel as radical because I have made them my state of comfort. In fact, going to the store makes me uncomfortable now. Consumerism, affluence, having so much while others have so little, that is now what makes me, you know, very uncomfortable. So as far as making yourself uncomfortable, you can do that simply by doing the things like getting rid of your car and only having a bicycle or trying to bike more and drive your car less or getting rid of stuff but and that is a practice in becoming uncomfortable but what I'd actually recommend is exercises in uncomfort and that's something that I have done a lot of that I didn't realize when I started would be so helpful in simplifying and downsizing and living more sustainably because again all of this comes down to social stigmas and social norms. So for example, one of the exercises that I did was that for one week I could only eat with my hands. No utensils at all. Forks, spoons, knives or anything. Whether I was at 
my house, whether I was in public, whether I was at a party, for one week I had to eat no matter what it was, with my hands, in public. That made me uncomfortable, but it was, some, it was a practice that I could take in practicing getting outside of my comfort zone. Leaving the phone for, leaving the house for 24 hours without your phone. That was very uncomfortable to me. 2011 Thanksgiving Day, I believe it was. I left my phone at home for the first time since really having a phone. And that was uncomfortable. I called my friends and said, I'm coming over. You won't be able to get in touch with me. Hopefully I make it. I'll be there in 45 minutes, hopefully. That was uncomfortable, but it was one of the most blissful days of the year as well, being free of that. Um, so that exercise of 24 hours with no phone was uncomfortable, but that was something that ultimately led to the point where I now have existed for seven years without a cell phone. Um, covering myself in trash and walking around New York City for a month. Boy, was that uncomfortable. And the purpose wasn't of that wasn't really to get outside of my comfort zone, but that worked. Um, so doing things that set yourself apart in society, that make you uncomfortable, that are within your range. Maybe it's um, singing or dancing in public is something you can do to get uncomfortable. Maybe it's wearing your clothes inside out for a day. Um, you know, doing any of these things that get you uncomfortable, just these these practices of being uncomfortable are surprisingly a wonderful strategy that will allow you to make these changes in a more fluent way. So yeah, challenge yourself to find ways to make yourself uncomfortable. There's practical things too, like having a five gallon jug and that's all your water for a day. It's a way to learn about how much water you use. It makes yourself uncomfortable. I biked across the United States um, trying to, and I wouldn't use any water from a faucet. Boy, did I like learn to respect the faucet after that. So finding these ways to intentionally make yourself uncomfortable that are in controlled experiments and environments can be a, you know, a very helpful way to do that. So what was the hardest possession for me to let go of? I would say actually my cell phone was the hardest. It was a dream. Okay, I can't say it was the hardest. There were a lot of hard things, but it was definitely one of the hardest. I was uh, sitting with my roommate Greg Radicone, and he had a flip phone. This was in 2012, and he had the old school flip phone, and I had the iPhone. And I was just like, man, how do you exist with a flip phone? And I was just, oh, how I would love to do that, but how I just could not possibly ever see that. And then getting past that to the point of not having a cell phone at all, that was extremely difficult. That was one of the last, I think that took me till 2014 or 2015, about three or four years after I started downsizing. And getting rid of that was, was, was big, but that was one of the most beneficial things because right here, you're the only people that I can reach or that can reach me in this time, in this moment. We're it. And that's the beauty of not having a cell phone. It forces presence in a world that makes it so hard to be present. And the cell phone is one of the greatest tools in preventing deep presence. So that was definitely one of the hardest things. And what I did, the exercise that I did to eventually get rid of it is I put it in the drawer. I turned it off and I put it into a drawer just for one month pretending for one month that I didn't have a cell phone and that month went really well so then I got rid of it. So I practiced that you know first. As far as the hardest project that I've done, there's really no project that's been the hardest. They've all been difficult in their own way. Some physical, some mental, um, some emotion, you know, emotional. So they've really all been, they've all had their own difficulties. And they've all occurred at different times in my life when I was 
more comfortable or less comfortable. Um, so yeah. Okay, so the question was, how effective is the St. Petersburg Recycling Program? This is a question that I've had that I've been trying to research for the last uh, couple of months. I've had the question of, should I recycle plastic or is it more resource efficient just to throw it in the garbage? If you're washing it and drying it and possibly using soap and all of that and all your time and putting it in the recycle bin and then they're going to end up throwing it away or burning it, like, I don't want to do that. So I've actually had the question of, is it better to, is it actually more environmentally friendly to throw it away than to recycle it? What I can say for certain is that nationwide we throw away a staggering amount of our recycling and I'm confident that St. Pete falls into that as well. I could imagine St. Pete being better than some parts of the United States, but still there's an incredible amount of, there's a lot of corruption in our both recycling and trash industries. Still today, they were formerly run by mafias and there's still an incredible amount of corruption in them. Um, so I can't say how effective they are. What I can say for sure is that the goal is always to reduce recycling in the first place by finding a way to purchase things that don't come in packaging in the first place. And then I think composting paper and cardboard as much as possible is better than putting it in the recycle bin. Um, I would say metal and paper and glass are generally the things that are recycled the most. Plastic is really kind of a joke to think that it's recycled. At best, it's downcycled, which means it's not turned into the same thing. It's turned into something of lower quality that is eventually in the next or the next stage going to the landfill. Maybe one last question, if anyone has one more question. Yeah. She said, uh, in my journey of simplifying my life, living a simpler life, have I reached the height of simple living or is there still more I want to do? I would say I got I'm not at the height because I've say I've actually gone a little backwards compared to where I was at one point. What's important to keep in mind is that once you've gotten to uh, sort of the destination, you have to maintain that destination and that is not easy because we live in a society that is constantly trying to pull you back in. And it takes a lot of energy and dedication and self-worth and commitment to stay at the point of sustainable living, of simple living, of more just living once you get there. I have an incredible number of friends who got to some level and they're back in the corporate America. So I will say that I, I struggle to maintain. The way that I look at it is that under our current system, you will generally be going against the grain of society day in and day out if you are trying to live in a manner that's beneficial to earth, community, and self. So once you get there, and at any point, it's about maintaining it. I would actually say right now, I am ready to get back into some simplification. I have just spent uh, three months I've uh, been running an internship. I did a work exchange for a three bedroom house and there's been nine of us living in the house together as a, as a team working on uh, local projects. And um, it has been a challenge for me um, living with so many people. For me, a lot of simple living is alone time and I haven't had nearly as much of that. And that program ends April 9th. And so I'm feeling uh, time soon of, of being able to get back to focusing on simplicity, being more inward. Um, so I've definitely accomplished a lot of what I'm trying to accomplish in sustainable or in simple living, but there's still more, much still work to be done. I, I can say that you, you get to a point where you've done, you can have accomplished a lot of what you want and, and it's a great, it's a great space to be in. Like, 
They say it's not about the destination, it's about the journey, but you can get to the destination of living the life that you really want to live. You, you, can, you can get there. And then maintaining it is, is definitely the key. So, um, so on that note, um, I do, I am going to be hosting a lot of classes and workshops. I live in Old Southeast neighborhood about three or four miles from here. So two things, I have a Facebook group where I post things. That's just called Sustainability in Florida if you want to join that Facebook group. And then I also just have a simple email list for people that want to know about our classes and volunteer events and workshops. So what I'll do is I'll put a piece of paper up here uh, with a pen and you can write your email on there. And this is Sheikha and Jameson back here. Sheikha and Jameson and I work together um, and live together. And so if you want to connect, uh, connect with them and Sheikha will, will you put the paper up here? Yeah. All right, well, I love you all very much. I'm so excited to be here in St. Pete and to see you all more. I hope to see you all more. And uh, thank you to, again, to Lita's Jungle and to Sands Market for putting this on. And let's definitely do it again on another topic this summer. Thank so, you. yeah. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to hang out. Uh, so come say hi. <laughs>